Hello, my name is Lise Bieri. I'm a family physician with the Civic Family Health Team and one of the investigators of the Deprescribing Guidelines Program of Research at the Briere Research Institute and the Department of Family Medicine of the University of Ottawa. Our research team has developed several evidence-based guidelines for deprescribing. Deprescribing refers to the planned and supervised process of dose reduction or stopping of medication that may be causing harm or no longer be providing benefit. Each guideline includes a two-page algorithm to help make decisions about when to reduce or stop a medication and how to do so safely while managing other symptoms that may arise. This video shows how to use the antipsychotic deprescribing algorithm. This is a class of drugs that have been used to treat psychosis, aggression, and agitation in those with dementia, among other conditions. The algorithm has a front side with the step-by-step -step process for deprescribing and a back side with more information to help with the process. Our first case is Denise, a 66-year-old woman recently prescribed quetiapine 25 mg at bedtime by the locum covering for her family doctor. Previously, she'd been on lorazepam 2 mg at bedtime for many years, but had that tapered and stopped last year. Starting at the top of the algorithm, we ask ourselves, why is Denise taking the antipsychotic medication? On questioning, Denise states that several months after stopping the lorazepam, she periodically still found herself finding it hard to fall asleep and sometimes waking up during the night. When she mentioned this to the covering physician last month, he suggested trying quetiapine. It's important to make sure that the antipsychotic was not prescribed for a potentially useful indication before considering deprescribing. You carefully review the chart and question Denise about the various symptoms that go along with the conditions outlined as exclusion criteria on the front page of the deprescribing algorithm. Given that the indication seems to be primary insomnia, the recommendation is to simply stop the quetiapine. This is a good practice recommendation based on the lack of evidence for benefit for quetiapine in primary insomnia. In addition, the safety of quetiapine for primary insomnia is not well established. Antipsychotics used at higher doses are known to increase the risk of sedation and falls. Therefore, quetiapine may be unsafe for Denise. Given the low dose and the fact that the drug is not being used to treat psychosis of some type, adverse withdrawal events are not expected to be serious. However, Denise may still have trouble sleeping. If this is the case, it's important to review drugs that may contribute to insomnia, such as caffeine and alcohol, and to consider non-drug approaches to help with sleep. As it turns out, Denise made a good effort to cut down on caffeine and alcohol when she was stopping her lorazepam, but has relapsed over the holidays with all of the socializing. She agrees to go back to eliminating caffeine after her initial morning cup and to drink wine only on the evenings when she doesn't mind waking up in the night. You also provide her with some sleep management strategies as they are outlined on the back page of the algorithm. For example, going to bed only when sleeping, not watching TV or surfing the web after going to bed, getting up and reading a bit in another room if not able to sleep, getting up at 7 a.m. each day, avoiding napping, and eating lightly during the evening. Denise agrees to stop the quetiapine cold turkey and you cancel the remaining refills. She agrees to let you know within a week or two how she is doing. Denise returns three months later with an unrelated concern and at that time she indicates she has been sleeping well. Our next case is Carol, a 90-year-old woman living in long-term care. Because of a previous stroke and dementia, it's hard for her to communicate verbally. Her list of medications includes therapy for osteoporosis, secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, thyroid supplementation, two inhalers for COPD, and a B12 supplement. About a year ago, she was successfully tapered off her omeprazole when no specific indication was found for its use. 
She's been taking olanzapine for the last four months. A chart review and discussion with the nursing team reveals a period of agitation and aggression about four months ago. She was treated for a UTI at around that time, and the care team feels that the olanzapine is keeping her behavior controlled. She has not had any episodes of aggressive behavior or agitation in the last few months. There doesn't appear to be a need for primary insomnia treatment or an exclusion criteria for deprescribing. Because Carol's symptoms have been controlled for three months, it seems reasonable to recommend deprescribing. Based on a systematic review of deprescribing trials in BPSD and application of the GRADE approach, the recommendation to taper and stop antipsychotics in this situation is considered strong. Engaging Carol's family in the discussion about deprescribing is important. They will feel better knowing that the risks of antipsychotic use will be minimized and how to watch for worsening symptoms of behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia or BPSD, including aggression or agitation should they occur. They can also help determine a tapering plan that everyone feels comfortable with. While no one tapering approach has been demonstrated to be better than another, consideration should be given to a slow taper. For example, a 25 to 50% reduction of the original dose on a weekly or biweekly basis. The team feels that Carol's baseline symptoms were not that severe, so the planned tapering does not need to be extended beyond this. The decision is to therefore reduce the dose to 7.5 mg twice daily for one week, then to 5 mg twice daily for one week, then to 2.5 mg twice daily for one week, then to stop. The care team also decides to flag Carol for the facility's BPSD management program. It's hoped that if she is less sedated, she'll be able to participate in the music therapy program and structured therapeutic recreation activities. In addition, the team recognizes that the initial episode may have been precipitated by a urinary tract infection, so attention must be paid in case those symptoms recur. Carol's daughter wonders if some of the agitation was due to a noisy environment and asks if her mom's door can be shut at night time. The pharmacist reviews her medication use and discovers she's had a long-standing history of receiving two doses of Ventolin at bedtime. Since this can cause some anxiety, he asks if the Ventolin can be held and Carol's breathing monitored to determine if it's really needed. Throughout the tapering process, the frontline staff are asked to report any worsening of BPSD symptoms and also to note whether she is more alert. The team doesn't note any relapse over time and sees no need to either restart the antipsychotic or use a different one. Had they picked up on any worsening of agitation or aggression, options include incorporating more individualized non-drug approaches to BPSD management, restarting the antipsychotic at the lowest possible dose, or using an alternate drug. Following the tapering period, Carol appears to be managing well without the olanzapine, she's more alert and able to participate in activities, and her family is pleased. I hope you found these examples helpful to understand how to use the antipsychotic deprescribing algorithm to make decisions about when and how to reduce antipsychotic use. Remember, the goal of deprescribing is to reduce medication burden and harm while maintaining or improving quality of life. It should always be done with planning and supervision by a healthcare professional to make sure it's appropriate and safe. The Deprescribing Guidelines Project was initially funded by the Government of Ontario through the Ontario Pharmacy Research Collaboration with recent funding through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I'd like to thank our team of investigators and staff, as well as all those who contributed to developing and reviewing each of the deprescribing guidelines and algorithms included in this important initiative.